If you go down in the woods today, you're sure of a big surprise. If you go down in the woods today, you'd better go in disguise. For beneath the trees where nobody sees, they'll hide and seek as long as they please. Cause that's where a coven of thirty-five witches was found horribly massacred in Somerset this morning. This particular song was written by Jimmy Kennedy, a man in 1932 who was born in Stable Grove Elm and wrote this song about a small copse of trees behind the church where he was buried and Stable Grove Stout Hut. This particular coven of witches, known for its Trump protests, political standings, and their open support of the strife in various locations about the world, has been a rather controversial subject for many places. People who have pointed out that they exhibit a grander level of compassion and recognition and understanding than their more traditional Christian brethren, the local churches of the area. Now, police are saying they have no clues as to who may be responsible for this violent act. But I would say that, given the nature of black magic, I don't envy them, because vengeful spirits in the wood will have no problem bringing those sacred woods into the homes of their assaulters and co-conspirators. And when they awake at night to hear the rustle of leaves and find an eight-foot-tall black Kodiak animal spirit with red eyes at the foot of their bed, that will be a very satisfying teddy bear picnic, to be sure. These are dark times. And these stories come from very dark places. Hello, listeners. This is Professor Jonas Armitage, and you're listening to Stories from Dark Places. On tonight's show, we should be listening to The Terrible Old Man by H.P. Lovecraft, a story about a feeble old man with eccentric activities, and questionable opportunities for others. The Christmas season is almost upon us. Have you done your shopping? Thankfully, I've been able to get most everything I need over the internet, and having done it preparatorily, I shall actually receive it before the Christmas day itself, unlike others I know who have waited until the last minute to get theirs done. I'm looking at you, Kai. You're going to have to get that girl something if you want her to stick around this year. Anyway. I'm going to put the bug out in your ear now. We're considering doing a holiday special on Christmas Eve. A reading. Would you be interested? Tell us what you think about it. You can find us on Twitter, storiesfromdir1, or email us at storiesfromdarkplaces at gmail.com. Now, without further ado, we shall get you to our story this evening. But first, a message from our sponsors. Do your friends and family members keep departing the mortal coil into the sweet release of death and the glorious and nobleness that is Dagon and the Elder Gods? Are you busy with work and home life and just can't find the time to handle their affairs? Then call Bob's Coffins and Plots. Bob Shipley has been a member of the Innsmouth community for over 60 years, and he believes that things like death and funerals are best left to the experts, and no one in Innsmouth knows more about death than Bob. Bob's Coffins and Plots. Let Bob handle your dead loved ones. It was the design of Angelo Ritchie, Joe Zanuck, and Manuel Silva to call on the terrible old man. This old man dwells all alone in a very ancient house on Water Street near the sea, and is reputed to be both exceedingly rich and exceedingly feeble which forms a situation very attractive to men of the profession of Misters Ritchie, Zanuck, and Silva, for that profession was nothing less dignified than robbery. The inhabitants of Kingsport say and think many things about the terrible old man, which generally keep him safe from the attention of gentlemen like Mr. Ritchie and his colleagues, despite the almost certain fact that he hides a fortune of indefinite magnitude somewhere about his musty and venerable abode. He is, in truth, a very strange person, believed to have been a captain of East India clipper ships in his day, 
so old that no one can remember when he was young, and so taciturn that few know his real name. Among the gnarled trees in the front yard of his aged and neglected place, he maintains a strange collection of large stones, oddly grouped and painted, so that they resemble the idols of some obscure eastern temple. This collection frightens away most of the small boys who love to taunt the terrible old man about his long white hair and beard, or to break the small paned windows of his dwelling with wicked missiles. But there are other things which frighten the older and more curious folk, who sometimes steal up to the house to peer in through the dusty panes. These folk say that on a table in a bare room on the ground floor are many peculiar bottles, and each a small piece of lead suspended pendulum-wise from a string. And they say that the terrible old man talks to these bottles, addressing them by such names as Jack, Scarface, Long Tom, Spanish Joe, Peters, and Maid Ellis, and that whenever he speaks to a bottle, the little lead pendulum within makes certain definite vibrations as if in answer. Those who have watched the tall, lean, terrible old man in these peculiar conversations do not watch him again. But Angelo Ricci, Joe Zanek, and Manuel Silva were not of Kingsport blood. They were of that new and heterogeneous alien stock, which lies outside the charmed circle of New England life and traditions. And they saw in the terrible old man merely a tottering, almost helpless greybeard, who could not walk without the aid of his knotted cane, and whose thin, weak hands shook pitifully. They were really quite sorry in their way for the lonely, unpopular old fellow who everybody shunned, and at whom all the dogs barked singularly. But business is business, and to a robber whose soul is in his profession, there is a lure and a challenge about a very old and very feeble man who has no account at the bank, who pays for his few necessities at the village store with Spanish gold and silver minted two centuries ago. Messrs. Ritchie, Zanek, and Silva selected the night of April 11th for their call. Mr. Ritchie and Mr. Silva were to invite the poor old gentleman, whilst Mr. Zanek waited for them in their presumable metallic burden with a covered motor car in Ship Street by the gate in the tall rear wall of their host's grounds. Desire to avoid needless explanations in case of unexpected police intrusions prompted these plans for a quiet and unostentatious departure. As prearranged, the three adventurers started out separately in order to prevent any evil-minded suspicions afterward. Misters Ritchie and Silva met in Water Street by the old man's front gate, and although they did not like the way the moon shone down upon the painted stones through the budding branches of the gnarled trees... They had more important things to think about than mere idle superstition. They feared it might be unpleasant work making the terrible old man loquacious concerning his hoarded gold and silver, for aged sea captains and notably stubborn and perverse. Still, he was very old and very feeble, and there were two visitors. Mr. Ritchie and Silva were experienced in the art of making unwilling persons voluble and the screams of a weak and exceptionally venerable man can be easily muffled. So they moved up to the one lighted window and heard the terrible old man talking childishly to his bottles with pendulums. Then they donned masks and knocked politely at the weather-stained oak door. Waiting seemed very long to Mr. Zanuck as he fidgeted restlessly in the covered motor car by the terrible old man's back gate in Ship Street. He was more than ordinarily tender-hearted, he did not like the hideous screams he had heard in the ancient house just after the hour appointed for the deed. Had he not told his colleagues to be as gentle as possible with the pathetic old sea captain? Very nervously, he watched that narrow oaken gate in the high and ivy-clad stone wall. Frequently, he consulted his watch and wondered at the delay. Had the old man died before revealing where his treasure was hidden? And had a thorough search become necessary? Mr. Sanek did not like to wait so long in the dark in such a place. Then he sensed a soft tread or tapping on the walk inside the gate, heard a gentle fumbling at the rusty latch, and saw the narrow heavy door swing inward. And in the pallid glow of the single dim street lamp, 
He strained his eyes to see what his colleagues had brought out of that sinister house which loomed so close behind. But when he looked, he did not see what he had expected. For his colleagues were not there at all, but only the terrible old man, leaning quietly on his knotted cane and smiling hideously. Mr. Sanic had never before noticed the color of the man's eyes, and now he saw that they were yellow. Little things make considerable excitement in small towns, which is the reason that Kingsport people talk all that spring and summer about the three unidentifiable bodies, horribly slashed as with many cutlasses, and horribly mangled as by the tread of many cruel boot heels, which the tides washed in. And some people even spoke of things as trivial as the deserted motor car found in Ship Street, or of certain especially inhuman cries, probably of stray animals or migratory birds, heard in the night by wakeful citizens. But in this idle village, gossip, the terrible old man took no interest at all. He was by nature reserved, and when one is aged and feeble, one's reserve is doubly strong. Besides, so ancient a sea captain must have witnessed scores of things much more stirring in the far-off days of his unremembered youth. Stories about home invasion always leave people divided. Do you hide, protect yourself, call the police? Or do you get a weapon and take aggression against those who've come into your home, striking first to prevent them from doing, delivering malevolence upon you and your loved ones? Everyone has their opinions about one or the other. And to each their own, I suppose. I'm not here to judge. Thank you for joining us tonight. You'll notice we uh, are having a shortage of sponsors at the moment. If you would like to be a sponsor for our show, please don't hesitate to reach out. Likewise, if you would like to be featured on the show, we would love to have you. Reach out. Send us something by email or message us on Twitter. We love to interact with our audience. And we would like to thank all of our followers on Twitter... Anchor, YouTube, or everywhere else on the internet where your podcasts are found, we want to thank you for joining us and sharing this experience with us. Your attention and attendance means the world to us all. Anyway, that's all the time we have for now. Good night, listeners. And please remember, when you hear that quiet knock on your door at night, and there's no one there. There's nothing to be afraid of. After all, some of the best things only happen in the dark. Stories from Dark Places was recorded before an imaginary studio audience. All stories performed on this podcast have expressed written consent from the original author. Jonas Armitage, his studio manager, and the entire staff of the WZHP Radio Inspector are fictitious characters, and it's probably for the best that you continue to believe that.